The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Mary Beard on Nero, one of the most infamous Roman emperors. Was he the sadistic murderer of legend, the emperor who fiddled as Rome burned, or has he been a victim of spin and myth? As well as getting Mary Beard's take on Emperor Nero and the show about him that's just opened at the British Museum, I talked to the exhibition's curator, Torsten Opper, about the exhibition and Neronian Rome. Also this week, as the first London Gallery Weekend begins, with 140 galleries across the UK capital taking part, we talk to Jeremy Epstein, one of the founders of the initiative. And in this episode's Work of the Week, we talk to the artist Nina Kachadourian about a very personal piece of embroidery created by her adopted grandmother, which has inspired a new body of work by the artist. Before all that, a reminder that you can sign up for our monthly Art Market Eye newsletter featuring the latest news and opinion from our art market experts. Go to theartnewspaper.com and click on the newsletter link at the top right of the homepage. And while you're there, you can also sign up for a range of other newsletters, including our daily email bulletin and our book club. Now, the British Museum has just opened a huge show looking at Nero, the Roman emperor who came to the throne as a 16-year-old in 54 CE and died a violent death at 30 after, if you believe the sources, killing his mother and two of his wives, singing and playing his lyre as Rome burned around him in the Great Fire of 64 CE, which gave rise to the phrase, fiddling while Rome burns, and then beginning the persecution of Christians. The show's called Nero, the man behind the myth, and is an attempt to grapple with the realities of Nero and his time, and the legend that was constructed about this last emperor of the Judeo-Claudian dynasty by historians amid the dynasty that followed the Flavians. I spoke to Mary Beard, the broadcaster and author, professor of classics at Cambridge University and fellow of Newnham College, and classics editor of the Times Literary Supplement, about Nero and the exhibition. Mary, the first object that we see when we go into the British Museum is a portrait bust of Nero of which only a tiny fragment is from the ancient bust and the rest is a construction much later and it seems to me this is a really emblematic object when we're telling the story of Nero isn't it in terms of how on earth can we tell the story of this man yeah I mean I think there's two things you see when you go into the show first of all you see a little statue of supposedly Nero as a teenager Nero as 12 or 13 Uh, and that's a good reminder that he came to the throne when he was still a kid 16 when he comes to the throne not 13 but 16 and then you see a very famous portrait bust but one that's effectively a much later confection and there is a kernel of you know like with many of these supposedly ancient busts there there is a bit of ancient sculpted marble in that but it's mostly, you know, redone 17th, 18th century. Um, And that, of course, is, it's a nice metaphor for Nero himself. You know, it's not that there's no facts, no truth that we can ever reach about Nero. There are bits of truth, not always the truths we want. But, you know, Nero's a work in progress. His portrait bust is still sort of a work in progress. Um, And we have to admit that we still love the myth of Nero. And, you know, I I hope this exhibition doesn't put people off the myth, you know, because, you know, we don't want to get rid of Nero fiddling while Rome burned. We just want to look the myth in the eye a bit more clearly. That's right. And what I love about the show, actually, is that, as you say, it's called The Man Behind the Myth. But it's not it's not a rehabilitation because it's just as impossible to rehabilitate him as it is to actually find the actual truth, right? No, absolutely. I, I think there's a long history, you know, going at least back to the early 20th century, but before, of taking some ancient imperial monster, you know, Caligula, Nero, uh, Domitian, and saying, you know, no, he was a sweetie pie, really. Well... <laughs> That is to miss the point. I mean, journalists love headlines, which says, new show says Nero good after all. You know, And that isn't the point of the exhibition. Um, you know, we, we have 
no clue whether Nero was good or bad, really. We don't know what it means to be good or bad. And we certainly, I don't think, would be rushing to dinner with Nero at the palace, really. But what the show does is shines a light onto what else you can say about Nero, which perhaps contradicts the stereotype. What the context is, can we get a different perspective on it? I'm not sure I would have chosen the title Man Behind the Myth. I think it's it's really meant to enrich our view of Nero. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about our view of Nero and where it comes from, because Tacitus and Suetonius are these figures that you know, are quoted in the exhibition, and they are, are they're they're the primary sources. They're, they're they're as close as you get to somebody in Nero's own time, right? Telling his story. Yeah, uh, actually, we've got quite a lot of wonderful literature from Nero's own time, but not telling the history of the reign of Nero. I mean, you know, Lucan's amazing epic poem, The Pharsalia, is written under Nero and many other things. But the main historical account unfavourably analysing the reign of Nero, comes from, what, what, 50-odd years after his death um, in the historian Tacitus um, and the biographer uh, of the Twelve Caesars, uh, Suetonius. Now, there's various kind of alarm bells should ring here. Partly, one of the things that the exhibition shows, I think, very clearly is that it looks as if there was a standoff between Nero and the elite. Our written sources come from elite writers um, and we are getting a very partial view. But I think just as important is that we're getting a retrospective view. And Nero's reign ends in basically military revolt. Uh, There's a civil war after him. A new dynasty comes to the throne. He's the last of the first Julio-Claudian dynasty. A new emperor, Vespasian, comes to the throne with a very different kind of image from Nero. And it is in the interests of the new dynasty to dump on Nero. And there is a kind of basic rule in Roman history, is that if an emperor is overthrown or assassinated, they have a terrible reputation. And it's, and it's very easy to say, yeah, they have a terrible reputation because they were bad and that's because they were assassinated. But you could flip that and you can say they have a terrible reputation because they were assassinated. And, you know, it's, it's a, an extreme version of history being written by the winners. The new dynasty establishes itself by dumping on Nero, saying, you need us, not that monster. (laughs) There's a lovely bit in SPQR where you talk about, you know, how is it possible that Tacitus could have known this tiny detail of Nero's attempted murder by drowning of his mother, Agrippina? (laughs) Basically, the story is that that effectively he organised for a very leaky boat, basically, so that she drowned. And her maid then claims, while she is drowning, to to be Agrippina and is immediately murdered yeah. by Nero's henchmen. Yes. So, and, and that sort of illustrates just how yeah. unreliable yeah. these sources are, right? Yes, and they're highly intelligent, often highly literary skilled confections based on and I don't mean this to undermine it, based on gossip, rumour and conjecture. I mean, we know we do it ourselves and we don't recognise it. You know, we have no clue what goes on in uh, Boris Johnson's flat that he shares with Carrie. I mean, you know, (laughs) but we think we do and we draw connections and we say, oh, it's because Carrie was worried about the dog, that dot, dot, (laughs) dot, you know. And we sort of know what we're doing, but the story has a kind of, has a strange truth value for us, which is not about accuracy, but about some version that we want to tell. Um, And it grows in the telling. And that's very, very much like what you find in Tacitus. I mean, the story of the attempted murder of Agrippina in a collapsible boat, I mean, it could come from kind of Roman drama, actually. And Tacitus is telling it in the service of what he believes to be a higher truth. You know, that how, how is imperial rule corrupt what you know how, how do you envisage the corruption of imperial rule and we we rather naively take it as if somehow he knew well you know it's like poisoning you know you're living in the roman world in a society that cannot tell 
poisoning from peritonitis. But, you know, you can keel over at dinner. It can be, you know, a natural illness. It can be a nasty shot of some awful toxin. Um, but you can see that the inferences, the connections that you want to draw. Why did he die? Well, let me tell you, etc., <laughs> etc. Et well, we're talking about poisoning. I wanted to talk about Agrippina because, again, in SPQR, you you say about how one of the great lost sources of the Roman period <laughs> is her autobiography. Yeah. She she comes across from the exhibition not least because there are some extraordinary works of art that depict her as an ex as a really genuinely extraordinary figure and if you read between the sources you know she's so instrumental in Nero coming to the throne she just it, she's a strong woman of course despised by a misogynistic culture of writing right so tell us tell us what your interpretation of Agrippina well, she does come over as a strong woman and of course we rather flip the interpretation of the sources because uh, Roman writers treat strong women as bad. We home in and say, ah, strong woman here. <laughs> now, I find it really, really hard to, to get a handle on Agrippina. You know, she's she's supposed to have you know, murdered the Emperor Claudius with the famous dish of poisoned mushrooms in order to slip her son Nero onto the throne. She's supposed to have had an incestuous relationship with Nero. He's then supposed to have got fed up with mum and has her killed with failed attempt in the boat, um, uh, followed by a successful attempt by just sending the boys in. And when I first started out doing Roman history, you know, I was very much of the flipping school. You know, that, right, OK, you know, Agrippina's influence is being decried, but come on, guys, let's, let's see a powerful woman here. And now I still have a faint hope that that's the case, that there are, that within monarchies, we know that the old, rather tired cliche of the power behind the throne isn't always wrong. You know, so I would challenge anybody to say that Agrippina had no influence at all. But there is still this feeling that in the Roman imperial court, whereas Roman historians themselves complain, you don't really know what happened. You know, and if we're not at dinner. We're not where the planning was. Back in the days of the Free Republic, we saw the discussions of the Senate, but now it's behind closed doors. Well, OK, so now it's behind closed doors and we have to work out for ourselves who made the decisions. And there is a, 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 a long tradition of pointing the finger at the woman. You know, Augustus's wife, Livia, is the first one of those. She poisoned her way to success and to putting her son on the throne. Um, and here we've got Agrippina and then there's Agrippina's mum. And, and sometimes I think, you know, this is 85% an explanatory tool. And that if we went, actually, although I'd love Agrippina's uh, autobiography to find out her side of the story it might be terribly dull there is a kind of awful <laughs> prospect that you, you know another day's weaving <laughs> right. um, one of the things that comes across from the show is is this idea that we're getting glimpses of everyday life but it's impossible to tell the story of everyday life in Rome through emperors can you say something about that because of course it's always attractive. We love the, as you say, we love the salacious detail, the, the grim murders and violence. But actually, what does it tell us about the people that lived around the, uh, and, and then through the empire? But I think it's a surprisingly useful lens for seeing the people, the ordinary people. You know, you're right to say it's very easy to be dazzled by a rather salacious version of life at court. But... Uh, if you keep your eyes open in this show, it's showing you all kinds of different versions of people who are not the toffs. And, you know, one of my very favourites, and this is still concentrating on the court, but not looking at, uh, you know, the people lying down to dinner, but the slaves. You know, I think court society um, incorporates the very rich, the very powerful, but it incorporates the bureaucrats, the servants, the slaves, the ex-slaves. And you can get a glimpse through some of this material to a certain reality in the life of a slave. I mean, my, my very, very favourite object in the show is kind of a 
ostensibly one of the, the dullest. It's just a rather boring block of marble, which is a tombstone with just the name of Claudia Ecloguet on it. And, you know, you, it would be very easy to walk past this and think, so what? Actually, we know from Suetonius that Ecloguet was the name of Nero's wet nurse and also the name of one of the people who uh, buried Nero after his suicide. And I find it really very moving to think that um, we don't have Nero's tomb, but there we are face to face, you know, a couple of inches away from the very tomb memorial of Nero's devoted slave wet nurse. That, you know, don't get too sentimental. You know, you know every dictator has a, a nanny that loved him. I'm not saying that because it, he had this, what we know is a close relationship with this woman, it makes him a better guy. But it's, it's that immediacy. And for me, it prompts a kind of bifocality of vision when I go round this show. So I, I'm very struck by the, the luxury, the very high quality artworks. I mean, Nero had, you know, one thing you'd say from him, had good taste. Um, <laughs> but with the other eye, I'm always trying to make myself think, oh, who made this? You know, who washed this up? And actually, you can bring back the other people into the picture as long as you kind of prod yourself to do so. You know, there are some tombstones and other things like Claudia Ecloguet, which which help you do that, remind you to do that. And there are some rather more humble uh, works of art, in, including uh, women's jewellery, quite recently found in Colchester, which was probably the jewellery of a, you know, a reasonably well-off but ordinary Roman woman who buried her precious stuff when Boudicca came along and never went back to... Uh, recover it and I'm afraid we can guess why. Um, so there are some things you can peg this onto but most of all I think you need to keep that that bifocal vision. You know, Who enjoyed this? Who used it? Who cleaned it? Who made it? Who cleared it up? Who served it? And so on. So I, I think all Roman exhibitions in a way let you think about ordinary people um, if you remember to. That section on Britain actually is a really strong section of the show, isn't it? Because you've got the, you've got the chains that were found in Anglesey, you know, the slave chains. Also, there's this lovely idea of how objects are discarded. Yes, they're buried, but also, you know, how how time shifts, and you can see how those objects were treated differently in different times. Right? Yeah, no, it, it, absolutely, exactly. And I, I hope people don't pass by the slave chains because they're. They're found in Anglesey, 1940s. I don't exactly know their date, to be fair, but um, it, it is a very, very reasonable assumption that they are Roman gang chains. And they're given star billing. Uh, and they're, they're chains under the spotlight. And I think that's quite important, partly because there is a tendency, uh, and perhaps I've fallen into it, actually, to to talk about Roman slavery as if it's, you know, faithful servants, sweat nurses, um, um, you know, the faithful household, you know, the ones who clear the dinner away. Um, and of course, those are the slaves that we know most about. So we tend to, to put it sort of into the category of 18th century retainers. Now, actually, Roman slavery has a very brutal face and its people with chains around their necks are uh, in mines, in the fields, in gangs and... You know, the whole Roman Empire depends on that, uh, basically, uh, in terms of political and economic hierarchy. And uh, stop and look at Ecloge and stop and look at the chains, I would say to everybody. In a sense, the most famous incident of Nero's lifetime is the fire, of course, and fiddling while Rome burns, etc. I thought that was that's a really interesting part of the show, too. Of course, there's the narrative of the fire explained. And it's only just hinted at the blame that goes with that and, and, and the blame and the persecution of Christians. How central do you think the persecution of the Christians is to how we now see Nero? <laughs> well, it's the double whammy before uh, poor old Nero, isn't it? That um, you know, We've got the distrust of the elite. We've got the dynasties that follow him wanting to dump on him. But there's also this 
let's put it you know, rather euphemistically, this incident with the Christians. And it's very, very hard to get to the bottom of that too. I mean, one thing that is absolutely certain is that because Nero is said to have horribly put some Christians to death after the fire because he found them a convenient scapegoat. I mean, what could be better? You've got a minority religious sect saying the the world is going to end in fire and whatever, and uh, uh, you point the finger at them, guys. Uh, And it was no doubt, also let's make no mistake, it was no doubt a pretty popular move in Rome at the time. But forever after, it presents Nero, it writes Nero in to the increasingly dominant history of Christianity as the first guy who killed the Christians. You know, so on Filarete's bronze doors of St. Peter's, who have you got? You've got one Roman emperor and it's Nero. <laughs> and yeah. if somehow we could uh, get round and see through some of the more standard political ways that the Romans marginalise and excoriate Nero, we've then got the other strand, uh, which is a a whole Western tradition of Christianity, uh, which does that too. And so in some ways, I think that's why you can never see through it. this This is not just a kind of thin veneer of hostility. This is... The hostility to Nero is embedded in the history of the West. So all we can do is have a go at clearing the woods a bit. We can't chuck it out. Is there any reason why Nero's particular acts of cruelty, his particular violence, has has carried through more so than some of the others? Because it seems to me that, you know, one of the arguments, again, of the show is he's just, he's in a way, he's a fairly typical, very young emperor who's doing pretty much what lots of the others did but also has this sort of public touch he can reach out to to the public in a way that others couldn't so how do you feel Nero has been sort of characterized more than many of the others as this particularly cruel and and violent man well I think it's kind of self-reinforcing really I mean you can isolate some of the building bricks behind this version of Nero but then you see it's kind of it's like a honeypot you know, it, you know, everything gets piled on, you know, and how many movies have you seen in which Nero is sitting in the Colosseum throwing Christians to the lions, you know, and you say, put your hand up and you say, excuse me, the Colosseum wasn't built, you know, when Nero was emperor. Ah, oh, right, but that somehow doesn't any longer matter. And he's become the kind of touchstone, you know, not the only touchstone. You know, Caligula, I think, is runs him a pretty close second. Caligula reigns much shorter time. Quite a lot of the text of Tacitus is lost for the reign of Caligula. You know, so these chance things kind of focus um, our attention onto Nero, who becomes a terribly convenient catch-all for for symbolising the tyrant, the larger-than-life guy, the political wastrel. I mean, how many times do you pick up, you know, once a year at least, a major broadsheet cartoonist will be wanting to say of um, some politician whose mind isn't on the job, you know, he's fiddling while Rome burns, and so there we have... Obama, Gordon Brown, whoever, you know, it'll happen to Johnson soon, a wreath around his head, playing a a lyre and wearing a toga and in the background, Rome is going up in flames. You know, it is now so entered the way we think about power that I suspect it's, you know, there's no point in trying to get rid of it. There's the only point we have is trying to make use of it in a more interesting way and say, oh, look, you can think of it differently. Uh, lastly I wanted to just as we began with an object I wanted to dwell on a detail of the show which I thought was really interesting which is this idea that there were Nero impersonators so we think of him as this terrible terrible emperor and yet in the eastern part of the Roman Empire there were people who were passing them off as a surviving Nero so tell us about that and what that tells us well it is a bit like fake Elvises, I th- sometimes think, you know, that Elvis is not dead and, you know, here he is. There are quite a lot of reasons why why we can be pretty certain that there was popular support in different parts of the empire 
for Nero. And in Rome itself, even Suetonius concedes that his tomb was decorated with flowers you know, in the years following his death. But the most stunning example of this is um, uh, what happens in the East, where Nero actually had scored a rather clever diplomatic victory over the rival Parthian Empire. Now, uh, senators didn't much like this because the senators like blood and guts victories, not diplomatic stitch-ups. Now, we're rather more keen on diplomatic stitch-ups, I think. So Nero having a great victory celebration when not much of a victory had been won and, you know, saying everything is fine is good. But I think we have to reckon that the further you go east, it was very popular in Greece and he was popular, you know, in what is now Iran, Parthian Empire. And there are just these little hints. Suetonius also says that there were people in the decades afterwards who claimed to be the Emperor Nero still alive. Now, one thing we know is that if you claim to be a dead emperor, you must be fairly confident that some people were keen on that emperor. You know, you, you don't, you, it is very, very rare to say, hello, um, that monster's, no, he's not dead, I'm him. So it's one of the strongest hints we've got that out there, you know, outside the metropolitan elite, which is in Trumpian terms, I'm afraid, um, how we see Nero, outside that, there were people who, rightly or wrongly, thought that he was worth cashing in on, naturally. So, and therefore, that there was enough popularity to make it worth pretending to be Nero. Well, Mary, thank you so much for talking to us about this. Thank you, Ben. Pleasure. I hope everybody goes to see the show. It's great. <laughs> Mary Beard's SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome, is published by Profile Books in the UK and priced £10.99 and by LiveWrite Books in the US and priced $17.95. Her next book is Twelve Caesars, Images of Power from the Ancient World to the Modern, which is published in September in the UK and October in the US by Princeton University Press and priced £30 or $35. Now, as well as speaking to Mary, I went to the British Museum to see the Nero show and caught up with Torsten Opper, curator of Ancient Rome at the British Museum, who organised the exhibition. Torsten, can you give us a flavour of Rome when Nero was emperor and give us a sense of the kind of movements internationally that were influencing that moment? It's a very complex, exciting society. After the civil wars... Um, there's peace, so that comes in with Augustus. There were decades of first colonial expansion, then civil wars, and then peace. So that leads to economic prosperity, and that is spread. But that leads to tensions. You have provincial elites from, from places like southern France, Gaul, who want to enter the Senate. You have money becomes the measure of all things. It's a big leveler because politically the old elite isn't as powerful uh, under the emperor as it used to be. So money is the measure of all things and luxury. It's an age of luxury. But it also means that former slaves can become extremely wealthy and acquire the same status symbols. There's almost an arms race in showing how, how your house is bigger than your neighbours. You have more marble on your walls and more, more gilding on your ceilings. And it, 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 it's full of inner tensions and conflicts, and they eventually erupt. And Nero is in power during this period and has to try and balance it. In fact, we're standing next to a section now in which there's a this really interesting label which, which describes how the sort of pre-existing elite was sort of very critical of the newly wealthy and the way that they displayed their wealth. Yeah, there's some great texts. There's uh, Petronius um, with a satiricon, which, which makes fun in the most extreme manner of, of one of these parvenu, if you like, uh, freedmen, former slaves. I used to read it for years and chuckle and think, God, look at this idiot and his pretensions and what. And then I realized it really is a document of extreme status anxiety among the elite. They feel threatened by these people. We have in one of the showcases next to us now, we have a silver treasure found um, around 2000 outside Pompeii. And it looks like an absolute elite 
a set of, of tableware, but the context makes clear that it belongs to some freedmen bankers from a nearby commercial port. So, you know, it gets really dangerous. Rich people have these luxury mansions, and then Seneca and others tell us they build a thing called a, a keller cellar pauperis, so a, a poor man's room, so they can, they can then withdraw for an hour and meditate and, and contemplate the simple life, and it's, it's all just fascinating or disgusting depending on your point of view <laughs> indeed he's a performer and this is a really significant thing in terms of yeah. his popularity he actually performs he, he, he races chariots and he, he basically is a theater performer in public forums. yes there, there are two things that come together there, there, there is really a, a change in attitudes when it comes to performing and who should perform and that's that's fascinating as well performers traditionally were lower class people uh, from an enslaved background or foreigners and what. So really low status in, in social terms in Roman society. But they could become stars, you know. There was the adulation and what they had, their, their groups of fans and supporters and clacks and so on. They could also become really wealthy. And that already is, is a contrast, you know. If someone with a low social status is a wealthy superstar, it undermines that whole class system. Um, so more and more members of the elite perform as well. Uh, that leads to tensions. It's then a question of whether they do it voluntarily or get paid for it. So Nero is part of that process. It's true, he's the first emperor to go on stage. But even among the conspirators against him later, we know that some perform publicly just as well. So it's a wider trend. But, and that's the other aspect, all these performances and performance spaces, theatres, circuses, they are highly politicised spaces. It's not just watching an opera, or it's watching an opera in 18th century Naples, right? It's all about shouting, making political demands. Theatres are where all the classes, in strict hierarchical order, mix together, and they can, they can face off against each other. So it's where the plebs meet the senate, it's the only place where the knights are all together and the emperor is there. And through chants and clacks, they can have a sort of ritual dialogue almost. They can ask for, for political reforms, uh, tax reduction, you know, the corn dole, all these things. And is it right that in terms of his theatrical performances, some of the sources sort of attempt to depict him as performing roles that, that sort of conform to that, that sort of biography of him that says he is murderous, etc.? Et it's a good question, and there's a really good biography of his that tries to, to use psychology so that he, he uses certain roles like Orestes um, to explain his own, his own choices and predicament. And Orestes had to kill his own mother because she'd murdered his father. So it's a classic tragedy. It's, it's a moral dilemma where there's no good outcome. So Nero performing that role might tell us something. But then the context, you know, everything said by this author about Nero is bad. So why did he just choose, you know, can we trust this catalogue of roles? I'm not so sure. So tell us about Nero's relationship with his mother. There is an absolutely stunning statue of her here in the show. Yes, and, and, you know, let's just talk about art for a second. You know, the, there's this statue you described, a statue of Agrippina. It looks like it's metal. I mean, it has this metallic sheen to it, really sharply carved, well-defined, very precise. Um, that's what the high end of art of the period is also about. This is carved from an, a very rare, exotic Egyptian hardstone, but you try and imitate the qualities of one material in another, which makes the job so much harder. Um, but she, she is the, the great figure. She's the great granddaughter of Augustus, so in dynastic terms, she's extremely important. She was very clever. We know she wrote a sort of autobiography, a history of her family that is still quoted uh, by later writers who, who hate her. She was important for stabilizing the rule of uh, of the imperial family of Claudius. That's why Claudius marries her and why he adopts her son. Getting back to the bloodline of Augustus is crucial. But she's hated, and that, that is true for most Julio-Claudian women, because the, Augustus didn't have any sons, so the line of descent goes through his daughter, his sister, and his wife and the stepsons. And that makes these women prominent in the public eye, influential behind the scenes, and that is completely not in tune with norms of Roman society, which is uh, unreconstructed patriarchy, really. You, you said, let's talk about art, because, frankly, there are just some extraordinary objects in mm. here. I mean, it, the, the stone carvings are remarkable. All these extraordinary personages that are so sort of central to our vision of Rome. And mm. there are some extremely sensitive carvings here. There are some bold uh, full-length figures, but the busts as well, just extremely evocative and powerful, and some of the most exquisite stonework. 
Yeah, I mean, Neronian art is among the best produced th- throughout Roman history. I mean, I, I, I'm a sculpture person, so I, so I, so I love the portraits uh, and so on. There's also a bit of detective work. Nero's statues were all destroyed after his death or removed and reused. So to get the bodies back uh, is quite interesting because they, the messages these complete statues carried is, is, again, very different from what we'd expect. You know, there's, there's a funny coin that shows a kithara player and Suetonius, one of the key biographers of Nero, says Nero even put himself on his coins playing the kithar. Now, we have the advantage of, of magnification. I challenge you, you know, look at that. There are no portrait features. It's Apollo. So people like Suetonius see what they want to see. But going back to art, um, I think the range of objects is great because there's, there's great official art and court art, gems and so on. Um, they're, they're products of, of everyday life. They're... they're Fragments of Nero's palaces in their exquisite, in their coloured marbles, and, and again a bit like the Acapina statue, little coloured marble inlays that that imitate wooden marquetry, uh, and, and so it's it's translating that it's it's the height of luxury, and that is never reached again after after the civil war. The next dynasty is much more frugal. Right. I mean, as well as those sort of exquisite objects, what I love about the show is that you've really got some tough objects as well. So, for instance, you've got the slave chains which yes. are just such a sort of when you when you confront those in the gallery it's a real sort of wow sit up and take notice here this is the reality of this experience in, in Rome at the time exactly I think that was really crucially important to us to tell a rounded picture and to balance the the elite literary sources with others so we have uh, another quirky object I really love is is part of a Pompeian kitchen wall that has incised graffiti in it and and you know it's actually a poem that commemorates Nero's and Popea his, his second wife's visit to Pompeii uh, and it's very positive and again and we have as as graphic reproductions we have some of the of the graffiti and and painted inscriptions from Pompeian house walls where interestingly okay so that's 11 years after Nero's death sometimes his name has been erased but in many cases it's still there and that's the street level popularity you, you, you wouldn't know existed if you just read the official sources. What I like about the show is that it to a certain extent reinforces that through the complexity of sources, through interpreting bias and so on, it becomes incredibly difficult to actually know much about Nero the man and certainly make an assessment based on those sources can you, do you, do you, is that is that in a way one of the points of the exhibition that that, that through the midst of time it, it becomes difficult to really gain a, a, a perspective on really what the man was like uh, i think broadly speaking that's true if that's your interest you can still follow him through his life and get quite close to him and the women around him and what i mean the first object in the exhibition proper is a statue of nero as a 12 or 13 year old uh, boy uh, and so there's that but i i personally uh, um, was more interested in w- what we learn about Neronian society. He's part of that society. He's young. He embodies it, and, and all its glory and flaws, you know, are summed up in his person. Tosin, thank you so much for talking to us. My pleasure. Thanks. Nero, the man behind the myth, is at the British Museum until the 24th of October. Coming up, we talk about London Gallery Weekend, and the artist Nina Kachadourian chooses our work of the week. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. A host of well-known figures have signed an open letter calling on Italy's leaders to safeguard Venice as it emerges from lockdown and faces the prospect of tourist hordes descending again on the Lagoon City. The appeal was prompted by Italian press reports that the first cruise ship for 18 months will sail past St Mark's Square on Saturday. Research has shown that the gargantuan cruise ships help erode the ancient and fragile foundations of the buildings and emit high levels of pollution that damage the city and its inhabitants. The letter's been signed by Richard Armstrong, the director of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the UK artist Anish Kapoor and celebrities including Mick Jagger and the actress Tilda Swinton. 
the heir to a French Jewish family that owned a Pissarro painting looted by the Nazis, has abandoned her effort to keep the work in France, instead transferring ownership to the University of Oklahoma, where it previously hung. Leon Noel Meyer hoped to reverse a 2016 settlement with the university that included an agreement to alternate display of the painting in the US and France every three years, after an initial five-year showing at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. But recently, Meyer sought to keep the work in France, arguing that she was unable to donate it to a French institution with the Sherry scheme in place. Now, after two French courts ruled against Meyer, the painting, The Shepherdess Bringing in Sheep, will return to Oklahoma this summer. And finally, a special investigation by Simon Magakian has revealed the covert destruction of Armenian Christian heritage in Azerbaijan. The evidence has been exposed in recently declassified Cold War spy imagery taken by the US in the 1970s, published by the art newspaper for the first time. With images and in-depth testimonies, Magakian reveals the destruction of an estimated 28,000 monuments. You can read the full report and more on all these stories at theartnewspaper.com or you can download our app for iPhone and iPad, which you can get from the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. On the 10th of June, Christie's New York presents La Reverie, the collection of Sidel Miller. Explore this extraordinary single owner collection of decorative arts and design from Sidel Miller's oceanfront Palm Beach residence, which came together making her unique dream a reality and highlighting avant-garde neoclassical 18th century French furniture juxtaposed with the imaginative French creations of Francois Xavier and Claude Lalanne. Viewing by appointment only at Christie's Rockefeller Center Galleries begins today, the 4th of June. In the meantime, explore the works and related features on christies.com. Welcome back. I'm delighted to tell you that a new series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, featuring in-depth conversations with some of the great artists of our time, begins next Wednesday, the 9th of June. You can listen and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you're listening now. Now, from today until the 6th of June, it's the first London Gallery Weekend, an initiative featuring 140 galleries across London. Georgina Adam, an editor-at-large at the art newspaper, spoke to one of the instigators, Jeremy Epstein, who co-founded the Adele Asante Gallery, about the Gallery Weekend and what it tells us about the market and London today. So, welcome, Jeremy. Um, let's start by saying, how did this start? It started by a conversation that happened between galleries during the pandemic. As a result of the shared experience of lockdown, we began um, entering into a much more immediate dialogue with each other, initially via the medium of a WhatsApp group um, that was created by Sadie Coles, connecting gallerists from across London of all different ages and sizes. Um, That shared experience and dialogue enabled us to connect on how we wanted the shape of London's art landscape to be. Um, And one of the things that uh, we found ourselves discussing um, in the moment uh, that Freeze Art Fair would have usually occurred, but unfortunately wasn't, wasn't able to for obvious reasons last year, we all had the same experience of the public entering our spaces as there was this kind of festive atmosphere. It was the tail end of London reopening after the first lockdown. And there was a bit of a reflection on that afterwards um, where, you know, gallerists said, wasn't this a, an important learning experience that there is this big local audience um, and that we could be doing more to engage them? I started a dialogue about the specific idea of uh, whether a gallery weekend format would be of interest to the community. And following several different outreach efforts, uh, we were able to establish a consensus that that is something that the community was interested in. And we then spent the next six months setting about creating that. So when you say we, how many are you approximately actually organizing this? So there there are 24 uh, members of the committee, and they are drawn from across different size galleries they're all from different areas of expertise so we have a true diversity and a true representation of what London's gallery community actually looks like Um, the way that we came together was on a voluntary basis it was obvious this was going to take a lot of time and so we basically put it out to the community is there anyone that is really passionate about this idea and has some creative energy to bring to it. And I think it happened to coincide with the second uh, lockdown announcement. (laughs) So we were fortunate to get some rather senior people, people who under normal circumstances would not have had the time to lend to this project. But I think a lot of people in those horrible winter months were quite happy to have something inspiring to look ahead to. Um, So yeah, we have a range of voices of all different ages from different galleries and everyone's working on the same team. 
Did you have any sort of a selection process? For the committee itself? Yes, and for the galleries. Um, for the committee, there was no selection process. It was a mixture of literally asking people to raise their hands. Um, and then myself and Joe Stella, who was the person who seemed to have the most interest in seeing this idea uh, materialize at the beginning. She was incredibly uh, vital to um, surveying the people that work in galleries that, you know, not necessarily the people with their names on the door, um, but who have an enormous amount of experience to bring to these little pockets of organization that we needed to work on. So we basically rung people up one by one. And then we started putting a, a sort of um, decentralized structure together so that there were little groups working on different areas, whether it was client outreach, um, events, programming, comms and partnerships, um, things like that. Mm, a lot of work. A lot, a lot of, of work, work. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it was a huge success because I remember at the beginning there was something like 70 galleries and now you're up to how many? Now we're at 140. Wow. Yeah. And so to answer your other question about the selection process mm. for that, it started out very much as a, a community that was having this conversation. So we created a survey which we put back to the community to ask them exactly what shape they'd want this event to take. And what we got back were quite clear consensus um, around all of the different sort of aspects of what a gallery weekend looks mm. like. That was about 80 galleries who formed the original sort of founding community, if you like. And once the first press announcement happened, we realized that there was a whole lot more out there than we were <laughs> uh, initially aware of. And we started getting contacted. And on that basis, we decided that the, the right criteria were actually to do with self-selection and defining exactly what, what do we mean when we say a commercial contemporary art gallery. Um, and so we basically wrote down the criteria, um, you know, that you have a, an ongoing exhibition program that you're free to uh, to visit that you're constantly programmed and open to the public and that you represent artists um, and essentially it was a case of galleries being able to self-identify whether or not they were a uh, fitting uh, mm. participant. Tell me how much are each gallery paying to participate? Um, so the participation fees were something that was again decided on by consensus. Um, we put out several different structures um, to the community and asked them to uh, basically vote on how it was that they wanted to see this financed and the way that we did it in the end was through a variety of different fee options galleries could select what they wanted to contribute uh, there were four different tiers and the idea was that the tiers align with the size of your business um, and we sort of measured that by the size of your staff so obviously there's a huge diversity of businesses involved in in this event some of them are literally one person and others are, you know, potentially hundreds worldwide. So it made sense that there was this almost uh, subsidization that's happening mm -hmm. where the larger galleries are basically enabling us to do something on a bigger scale and smaller galleries benefit, but the amount of exure is sort of proportionate. Mm. But what's roughly, I mean, what's it's, the it, lowest and what's at, the highest? Sure. I mean, it's three, 300 to 3,000 pounds. Okay. So it's incredibly economical compared to going to an art fair. Yeah. Makes an enormous difference. Art fairs can cost 100,000 plus, can't they? Yeah, it's um it's very economical. I think this year in particular it felt particularly economical because we had all of the startup costs involved. So we we wanted uh, to build a proper brand for this that felt like it was befitting of such a big expansive gesture for London's gallery world. Um, we wanted to have a proper website. You know, we initially this was something we discussed: should it just be done organically without any infrastructure whatsoever, which would be much easier, or do we want it to be something that really is public facing and has the opportunity to advertise it to, itself to a broader audience? But doing that has meant building a brand, building um, a, a website that I, I would almost describe as groundbreaking <laughs> in some of the technology that's in it. Um, but uh, basically looking towards building something that will be able to last in future years. So this year was really about just establishing that and the gallery's contributions to it has basically enabled us to build something for the community. Mm. In future years, it will be much more of, of that mentality of, well, what do we get out of it on a year-to-year -year basis? Because um, obviously we're quite restricted in the activities that we're able to do within a post-COVID environment. So a quick question, how did you choose the date? Um, again, the date is another consensus-led decision. Right. Um, we looked at several different moments in the year that we thought could be interesting. The general idea was that 
London galleries have freeze as one of these critical moments in the year to look forward to. So it had to be something that was distanced from that. We all agreed that London could bear to have another major event in its diary aimed at the international community and that people are looking for an excuse to come and visit us. Um, so we then thought, well, what's a nice time of year to visit? And naturally, June is a pleasant time of year. But more importantly, it's a pre-existing um, date in the London Art World Diary because you usually have the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition mm -hmm. opening around now, which has a huge um, pull. And in addition, there's the Serpentine. Um, so we thought about that. And then we also thought about the fact that many people come to Basel um a, f a couple of weeks down the line and the Zurich gallery weekend the weekend before Basel so we thought we'd add one more stop onto that train and hope that there might be some real enthusiasts that would find their way to us and onto Zurich onto Basel oh well yes I mean there's been a lot of talk and I indeed have written about this is are such gallery weekends going to replace art fairs which on the whole are just not happening at the moment so what do you think are the advantages of these gallery weekends uh, the first advantage is that galleries aren't required to travel anywhere. It's more of a case of us attracting the audience into our spaces. Um, I think the second advantage is uh, that we have an enormous uh, spirit of collaboration, whereas at fairs you're in this very singular space making sure that you cover your costs and ideally get into profit by the end of them. Um, during the build-up to this event, it really is a sense of collective efforts for collective outcomes. Um, I think, uh, finally, um, what we're really looking to do through this gallery weekend is to, in a sense, take on a bit of the mantle uh, that the fairs um, have carried for a long time. They've enabled us to expand into audiences that we wouldn't necessarily have had access to. And I think that over the last year, a lot of individual galleries have felt that they wanted more control over that audience. And as one community, during the course of the planning of this, one of the big questions for us has been how is it that we're going to consolidate and expand the London audience and bring the international crowd back to London. And this really was not necessarily a fix all, but it was at least one of the broader solutions that we came up with. Is there an interactive map? I know that the art newspaper has got its microsite. Have you got some system as well to help people navigate? Yeah, we, uh, in addition to the art newspaper's microsite, which is an incredible portal for information about shows that are happening and different trends in terms of the types of exhibitions that are happening across all the different areas, um, on our website, you'll find the exhaustive list of galleries and the shows that they have on alongside the events that they're programming, especially for the weekend. And the interactive map um, is the central feature of the site, which this is the bit that I think is... Um, relatively groundbreaking. You can go through the site, favorite the galleries that you want to see and plot a map through those different spaces. And you can download that map onto your phone using a QR code, which you can then share with friends if you want to meet someone and you can you know, ideally say, this is my route, you can meet me somewhere along the way. Um, in addition to that, you get both of our transport partners flagged while you're plotting your route. So you'll see that we have discount codes available with Free Now, which is the taxi app, and with Line Bikes. Um, so there's many different ways to navigate it, but the idea is that each person can find their own route around 140 odd spaces. <laughs> Excellent. Is there anything that you're particularly looking forward to? Well, I've got a uh, two-year-old son, so I'm quite excited about the children's dimension to the Gallery Weekend program. We partnered with the Royal Society of Sculptors to create a children's guide to Gallery Weekend. And in addition, we invited all of the galleries to create special events for the weekend. And one of the trends that we saw were these children's events, which um, you're getting at, I think David Zwerner in particular, have made a uh, sort of takeaway pack for kids. And I know Waddington Cousteau are doing something as well. Um, but as a visitor, I think one of the really um, singular experiences of Gallery Weekend is that many galleries are making senior staff and artists available to do guided tours of the shows that they have on. And that um, is really what this whole project is about. It's about um, an outstretched hand to the public in this year it's about the local public and um i guess demythologizing the scary art space and the, one of the methods will be you know through actually interacting with the public and inviting them into these shows 
So from what you were saying, you've spent a lot of your budget this time on building up your website, just basically doing everything necessary to make it work, to make it attractive. So this means that this is certainly not a one-off. You're coming back again and again. Is that right? That is uh, definitely the intention, yes. Um, We set out to do it as um, something that will have staying power. Um, Our local audience is incredibly important to us and I think that you know COVID in a sense has granted us permission to think a little bit differently about how to approach um, both the local audience and the international audience as um, a sort of collective group of galleries but um, it's very important to us to reaffirm our commitment to the local audience in London I think there's a feeling that we could be doing a lot more to um, almost update our relationship with them um, let them know the fact that our spaces are free to visit, that they're programmed year round and that you can see world class museum quality shows alongside very risk taking exhibitions in these spaces all year round. Uh, I noticed you mentioned COVID. Are there any precautions? Have you got, for example, hand sanitizers everywhere? Obviously, we haven't yet reached the end of partial lockdown. The restrictions themselves um, are down to the galleries to implement because each gallery has a different size, so it can accommodate a different amount of visitors mm-hmm. at one time. On the other hand, uh, we chose our dates with a relative amount of confidence because we knew that spaces are able to restrict the amount of people that enter. Uh, we already saw that that could be done quite successfully throughout the the last unlocking moment, and hopefully that'll be the case again. So, you know, galleries are incredibly safe places to visit. They're contact-free spaces on the whole. Um, the numbers are always controlled. So I think people can feel very safe when they're entering into the individual spaces. It sounds to me as if London Gallery Weekend is going to have something for everybody. So thank you so much, Jeremy, for telling us all about it. Thanks for having me. London Gallery Weekend begins today, the 4th of June, and continues until Sunday. For full details on participating galleries and their various opening times, visit londongalleryweekend.art. And as Georgina and Jeremy mentioned, you can read a host of reports and features on a dedicated microsite at theartnewspaper.com. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. Nina Kachadorian has an acclaimed exhibition at Pace Galleries in New York. In a new work for the show, her Armenian background is to the fore. Lucy's sampler, an engraving with letterpress text, depicts an embroidery sampler made by Kachadorian's grandmother, Lucy, who was orphaned in the Armenian genocide around 1915 and was later adopted by the artist's paternal grandparents. The sampler, made by Lucy at age 12 while she was still living in an orphanage, is one of the only extant artefacts from her childhood. Nina spoke to Helen Stoilus, our America's editor, about this work and more. Nina, I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about a very personal work that's kind of influenced your work and that you've created work based on. It's a sampler and it's on it's on view right now at, at Pace Gallery in your in your kind of retrospective in your survey show. It's a sampler created by your adopted grandmother Lucy while she was in an orphanage after the Armenian genocide. Um, can you tell us a bit about your your memories of this piece and how how it's kind of how you've responded to it and how it's how it's kind of played into your own work? Sure. My show that's up at Pace right now, the very newest work in that show, is this piece called Lucy Sampler, which took several years actually to to finish. It was a project that kind of moved on a very slow timeline. Um, I'll first describe just what it is. It's a print. And it was made by taking a piece of clear plexiglass and placing it over this object, Lucy's sampler, which I'll talk about next. And then by using an engraving tool, scratching out every um, place where Lucy had made a stitch. So I'm sort of going over her marks in a sense, like scratching out every one of her stitches and sort of remaking her embroidery sampler. And underneath that, which has been reproduced um, with its very laborious process of inking up all these different parts of the plate differently to correspond to the colors correctly. Um, Then I've also written a short text underneath it, which tells the story of what the sampler actually is and who Lucy also was. It's a long story, a complicated story, and a very tragic story, um, although one I would say with sort of a happy ending. Um, But Lucy was an Armenian genocide orphan, probably lost her family around 1915 when she was about four years old. She never had any idea what her 
given name was, what her biological family's name was, where she was born, where she came from, anything. Probably witnessed all kinds of atrocities. She happily, in some ways, had managed to suppress a lot of those memories by the time she came into my family. But occasionally something would happen and she would get very, very upset. Wow. And, you know, it always seemed sort of like a sign that there were, there were distant, buried memories in there somewhere. And then after the, the First World War ended, this, by the way, all happened in Turkey, I should have said, mm -hmm. um, Lucy ended up in an orphanage in Lebanon, in an orphanage called The Bird's Nest, where a lot of these orphaned Armenian kids were living and where they were trying to sort of find Armenian homes for these kids to go back into. And as the result of that effort, my uh, paternal grandparents, before my father was born, decided to sort of make a place for Lucy in their home. And it was kind of an odd arrangement. It wasn't exactly like they adopted her. It was sort of like, well, we want to help one of these Armenian kids. And, you know, we could sort of maybe use a little help around the house. And they, they hadn't managed to have children of their own yet. So they thought, you know, if we do, then maybe Lucy can kind of help raise this child. Mm. And, and all those things are exactly what happened. So when my father was born, Lucy became something between a nanny, an older sister, a second mother, a caretaker, yeah. this kind of mixed set of roles. And um, I grew up very close to her. She, she and my biological grandmother, my father's mother, fled the civil war in Beirut in the mid-70s, wound up in suburban California and never went back. Wow. So I grew up with them really sort of down the street. And, um, and Lucy took care of everybody. She cooked, she cleaned, she sewed, she mended, she ironed. She just, you know, that was what she did. And she was incredibly skilled at needlepoint as a child. And all these years later, the very few number of objects that she saved and that survived all of these cataclysmic events in her life, among those things were the sampler. And she must have saved it in part because she was really proud of that work. And, you know, she must have saved it because in a way, I say this in the text that I wrote, it was a little like a CV of like, you know, this might get me security. This might allow me to be taken into some. Yeah, it shows her work. skills, right? As, as a... Yeah, it shows her skills. It shows that, you know, even at this young age, age 12 or so, she was like unbelievably skilled. And I mean, I have other... Um, you know, pieces of embroidery by her that she did as an adult, like that are fully finished and magnificent. And she was unbelievable also at crocheting. She crocheted me a giant queen-sized bedspread oh, that wow. is like a work of art. And she crocheted me long before I had any intentions of getting married. She crocheted me a wedding dress oh, and used wow. to say, yeah, yeah. And she used to say, come on, get married. You already have the dress. And <laughs> And I had actually, in fact, already met the person I was going to end up marrying. But we, we kind of did things backwards and decided to get married 15 years after we met. And um, Lucy was gone by then, but I did wear her dress. I was going to say, Brooklyn did the dress City fit? Hall. Yes, the dress fit beautifully. Oh, and that's I got wonderful. Married in it. Oh. Is the sampler, I know you, you mentioned, you know, seeing her work and seeing her kind of skills through your entire life, not just her oh, artistic yeah. skills, but her caretaking yeah. skills, those kinds of skills that aren't as visible unless you're a loved one, you know? Do you remember this piece specifically? Is this something that she... No, no, this wasn't something she ever showed me. Yeah. She never showed this to me. This was something my mother had framed for me, like, oh, you know, wow. 20 years after Lucy died. Like she said, here's something I think you would really appreciate. Lucy saved this. And um, it, it was, you know, I, I only saw the sort of finished, magnificent things that she would spend years making sometimes or, or you know, I mean, I wore sweaters from the age of you know zero to to the year she died I have sweaters that she knit me and she could knit unbelievably quickly and accurately and make anything from just a picture like I could say here's you know a complicated cable knit sweater and all I have is a photograph of it and she would be able to figure out the pattern wow she had an incredible mind for these these sorts of you know puzzles but you know this is the kind of work that rarely gets sort of taken up seriously mm. and rarely gets mentioned and it's very much appreciated by the people who are directly kind of benefiting from this kind of care but um part of the reason I made this piece is because I wanted to sort of you know honor her but also honor this kind of work which you know by and large is done by women mm. too <laughs> needs to be said yeah so are there any other kinds of pieces like that that were in your life that that you kind of remember as 
you know. Well, I, I could jump to the other side of the family now yeah. and tell you a story that has to do with my mother's mother. And so my mother's mother, who we called Nunni, her name was Runa Lindforce, but we called her Nunni. And this now is, is not, not an Armenian story, but this is my Finnish Swedish side. Um, so uh, in Finland, there is a small minority of people who speak Swedish as their first language. And um, my mother comes from kind of this language minority within Finland. I grew up knowing my grandmother Nuni really well and spent many, many, many summers um, in Finland. We, we would spend the summer in Finland with my Finnish family. And um, my um, grandmother would have been an artist if she had been able to um, make that choice, you could say. It wasn't a choice that was really afforded her for, for both sort of economic reasons, but also just... Um, Things got in the way, like World War II. <laughs> so, you know, she she painted and drew and made things her whole life, but um, and even had some small exhibitions. But, you know, she never was professionally an artist. And we have a lot of her drawings. We have a lot of her paintings. And we have a very unusual family document, I'll call it, mm -hmm. that she made. Um, I'm never sure what to call it, because to me it kind of, it's shockingly like a kind of artwork from a kind of conceptual art tradition that she was never a part of. But what, what Nuni did is that she would take my mother and my mother's sister was six years older. She would take them outside every year on their birthday. My mother was born in July. Um, she would take her and sort of place her outdoors wearing a small cotton hand-sewn nightgown oh, wow. that my grandmother had made for her. This nightgown was sewn to fit a girl around age two, let's say, like a little kid. And she put my mom in the nightgown and took a picture of her outside on her birthday. And she did this every single year until the year my mother could physically no longer pull that nightgown over <laughs> her head. And this happened to be when she was 15. She's wow. like this lanky teenager. And then much, much later, when my mother was like in her late 30s, I think she said, my grandmother bound this into a book, an accordion folding book, and gave it to my mom. And when you unfold this thing, you see this unbelievable wow. timeline of a girl getting older and outgrowing this nightgown that stays the same size. And these pictures have been taken. They're in black and white. They've been taken largely in the part of the Finnish archipelago where I've grown up spending my summers. What I ended up doing with my mom's help in the early 2000s, we started this project together of trying to find each of the original locations where these pictures were taken. So it was like a treasure hunt. My mom and I would go out there with this bound accordion folding book, and we would sort of keep stepping back and forth to line up, you know, horizon lines and rocks and certain trees and houses. And all of a sudden, it would sort of snap into place. And we'd be, we'd be like, oh, my God, this is where she was when she took the photo in 1940 or whatever it was when my mom was a kid. And then once I had done all those, I wrote a text that kind of accompanies each pair of photos, the one my grandmother took and the one that I retook with my mom, and put this together into a, a sort of timeline. So <laughs> it's another instance where I've sort of followed a family document. And the challenge for me has been that I, I never want to sort of hijack the original object. I mean, the question has always been, how can I kind of collaborate with this object and with this person posthumously while still having that original thing maintain its autonomy in a sense. Like, I don't want to overtake it. I don't want to sort of um, take credit for it. So both of these pieces have taken a really long time to work out because I felt so strongly about that and finding the right kind of balance, I guess. Well, it sounds like more of a continuation than a taking over. It sounds like it's continuing that thread. Yeah, I think I think if I got it right, then both of these pieces do function that way. But it's a tricky thing working with family material, because I think I, I, I've spoken a lot with my students about this. Um, you know, you can sometimes feel such reverence for the original mm. thing that it can actually be hard to work with it because you're not willing to change it. You're not willing to do anything to it. It just has to be there as kind of a holy object. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and that's tricky for an artist because you do have to be willing to kind of take a sort of ownership of it in order to work with it too. Yeah. So it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Nina. This has been really great. Well, thanks for having me.
Nina Kachadurian's exhibition Cumulus is at the Pace Gallery in New York until the 26th of June. And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so. And please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahouska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Mary, Torsten, Georgina and Jeremy, Helen and Nina. And thank you for listening. See you next week when we'll be talking to the Gorilla Girls. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.